Hi, my name is Peter Thomas, President of Resource Compliance. In this short video, we'll provide instructions for completing an annual pressure vessel inspection using the checklist in Appendix B from IIAR Standard 6. The checklists contained in IIAR 6 Appendix B are derived from a legacy document named IIAR Bulletin Number 109. For years, the Bulletin 109 checklists, or B109s, served as the gold standard for documenting annual mechanical integrity inspections for ammonia refrigeration equipment. In 2019, IIAR retired Bolton 109 when the first edition of Standard 6 was published. Standard 6 addresses the minimum requirements for inspection, testing, and maintenance of ammonia refrigeration systems, and includes slightly altered versions of the B109s in Appendix B. The checklists are typically two pages. The first page contains contact and equipment information, and the second page has the inspection checklist. While all the information on the second page will change year to year with the equipment inspection, much of the information on the first page should stay the same. For this reason, you may only have to fill out the first page of each piece of equipment once. For subsequent years, you should only have to fill out the second page. The simplest part of completing a pressure vessel checklist is filling out the contact information. Each IIAR6 checklist requires the inspector to indicate the location, owner, and physical address of the system. The contact name and phone number should be the facility representative responsible for ensuring the inspection is completed. Additionally, the inspector must write his or her own name and the date of the inspection. The ID or tag number belongs in the upper right corner and can typically be found on the equipment label or PNID. Next, the inspector should indicate the application of the pressure vessel. In this example, a high pressure receiver was being inspected, so the corresponding box would be checked. The vessel orientation must be indicated as either horizontal or vertical. Much of the information requested in the section titled Equipment Data and Limits can be obtained from the pressure vessel nameplate. The operating pressure, temperature, and normal liquid level will vary from vessel to vessel and will require operator input or design information about the system. The internal volume and normal ammonia inventory are typically calculated using a spreadsheet. If unknown, the vessel material can be determined from the Manufacturer Data Report, or U1 form. Most vessels have a level indicator. In this example, the vessel has a flat armored level indicator, so that box would be checked. Another common type of level indicator is a bullseye column. The final information required on the first page of the checklist pertains to the vessel relief valves. The manufacturer, model, pressure setting and capacity can be obtained from the relief valve nameplate. If your facility reprints the same completed first page for each checklist, this is one data point on the first page that can change. Be sure to check if the relief valve installed matches what is listed on the form. The year installed can be determined by inspecting the installation date tag attached to the relief valve. In this example, the vessel is protected by a dual relief valve assembly consisting of two relief valves and a three-way relief isolation valve. The relief valves are external to the equipment and terminate to the atmosphere, so this configuration is categorized as external. The second page of the checklist contains 20 questions that should be answered yes, no, or not applicable. The wording of each question is such that a yes answer is always positive and a no answer indicates a deficiency. Some questions may not be applicable to a particular vessel and should be answered N.A. Item A asks if the vessel is labeled and has a legible nameplate. A proper label consists of the component name and ID number. IIAR Standard 2 contains the requirements for pressure vessel nameplates. Since Standard 2 is a design standard, it is important to consult the addition of Standard 2 that was in effect when the vessel was built, as some requirements may have changed. For example, the 1984 version of Standard 2 did not require the nameplate to contain the Minimum Design Metal Temperature, or MDMT, but the 2021 version does require that information. Since this high-pressure receiver was manufactured in 1984, it is not surprising that the nameplate lacks that information. Items B and C ask if the vessel is suitable for ammonia and operating within limits. The inspector must verify that the vessel is ASME stamped and not constructed of materials such as copper that would degrade if exposed to ammonia. The two primary operating limits of concern are pressure and liquid level. The pressure should be at least 10% lower than the relief valve set pressure. The liquid level must have adequate vapor space to accommodate liquid expansion if the vessel experiences an unexpected heat load. 
As a good practice, Read a Book 1 recommends limiting the liquid level to no more than 80%. This leaves 20% of the vessel volume as room for expansion. The 80-20 rule is based on the actual expansion change seen in anhydrous ammonia liquid that is stored at negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit and allowed to warm up to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Item D requires the inspector to verify that supports and anchorage are adequate. For a ground-mounted pressure vessel, the anchorage should be inspected to ensure nuts are tight and free from corrosion. IIAR6 has a separate piping checklist, so the focus of this question is not on pipe supports. The vessel should have safe access for normal service and maintenance. While this vessel is ground-mounted, the king valve cannot be accessed without a ladder, so the access is inadequate and must be improved. It should be noted that the requirement for having permanent access to manual valves applies specifically to valves involved in the system emergency shutdown procedure, like this king valve. The inspector must do a visual inspection of the entire vessel to verify the equipment is free from excessive ice buildup, vibration, and leaks. Where possible, the vessel should be inspected from all sides to avoid missing a deficiency. Item F asks specifically about ice buildup, which would only be relevant to vessels on the low side of the system. Item I inquires if the pipes are marked as required by IIAR Standard 2. Standard 2 requires piping mains, headers, and branches to be labeled with the following. The word ammonia should be printed in black letters. The physical state abbreviation, liquid or vapor, the relative pressure, high or low, an arrow depicting the direction of flow in the pipe, and a service abbreviation indicating the purpose of the pipe. Items J and K pertain to valves associated with the vessel. All valves should be visually inspected. Deficiencies that should be recorded include corroded or painted stems, missing hand wheels, damaged seal caps, or excessive valve body corrosion. In this example, the king valve has cobwebs on the hand wheel, which is an indication that the valve has not been exercised or lubricated for some time, which should be recorded as a finding. The vessel must have sufficient instrumentation for monitoring the vessel operating conditions per item L in the checklist. For most situations, a pressure gauge is sufficient to satisfy this requirement. Items M and N ask if the vessel's certification drawings and manufacturer data report are on file. The data report, commonly referred to as a U1 or U1A form, we like to call the vessel's birth certificate, as it documents the important vessel characteristics when it was manufactured. For vessels registered with the National Board, the data report can be obtained from the National Board website for a small fee. The certification drawings are provided by the vessel manufacturer and should be available on site. In this example, the certification drawing and data report were unavailable and since the vessel was not registered with the National Board, the only means to obtain the documents will be from the vessel manufacturer. Item O asks the inspector if the vessel is free from modifications. While this cannot be conclusively answered in the absence of a data report, the inspector can still look for indications that alterations have occurred. If there is evidence of vessel modifications, the appropriate checkbox in item P must be answered. Item Q asks the inspector to verify that the sight glass is adequately protected from traffic, equipped with 360 degree guards, and configured with internal check valves if the glass breaks. This armored sight column satisfies all of the requirements. It's worth noting that bullseye columns are not required to have the internal check valve protection. When a vessel is insulated, the insulation system must be inspected per item R. Deficiencies such as jacket damage, breached vapor barrier, and ice buildup must be noted. This high pressure receiver is not insulated, so NA and not insulated should be checked. A thermal imaging camera can be helpful to identify insulation system failures that cannot be observed with the naked eye. For non-insulated vessels like this one, item S requires the entire surface of the vessel to be inspected and any surface corrosion or pitting must be recorded as a deficiency. While not specifically listed in the checklist, ultrasonic thickness testing can be used to gauge the amount of material that has been lost due to corrosion. Thickness readings can be used to determine if the vessel is fit for service and the remaining useful life. The checklist concludes with item T, which serves as a catch-all for all other concerns that the inspector may have observed. The area below can be used to write a description of the deficiencies. This concludes the IIAR6 Appendix B Annual Inspection Checklist for Pressure Vessels. I trust you found this information useful. We have more videos on our channel about ammonia refrigeration and process safety management. Feel free to check them out if you're interested.